Hi. Well, good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good? Good? Okay, great. We're lively, right? Hear the kids playing in the background, and uh, you know, we have some more, more of our kids. If you're like 10 and under, I guess, you can go ahead and head to Children's Church, get out of your head that way. Um, and then we'll get into our message this morning. All those who have joined us, if you're uh, here in person, then uh, welcome. Uh, if you're new, uh, make sure you grab a little visitor card. We'll get you one of those if you do not get one. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, afterwards, uh, if you're listening online, then uh, welcome as well. Uh, I love to see people's faces, uh, but if this is the place that you find church uh, during the week, then I'm glad that you're here as well. Uh, feel free to make a little comment or something on the Facebook group. We'd love to get connected to you uh, in that space also online. Uh, so uh, we're in our series. Uh, we've been in this series, Books of the Bible, and we've been in it for the last three or four weeks or so, and um, now we're moving into the temple inner door, the temple inner door. And uh, we're going to be in Hebrews, so go ahead and turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, then there should be one in front of you in the little insert underneath the chair. Uh, Hebrews 10, uh, verses 1 through 18, doors of the Bible, the inner temple door. And we're looking at this idea of holiness, so the phrase that I want you to remember, if you don't remember the text or anything else, is how to achieve holiness. Now, when we think about that idea, we kind of think that that seems relatively unattainable. How are we supposed to be holy. Uh, how are we supposed to be um, close to God? Well, the good news is that God's done most of the work for us, right? If you have any background in church, if you've grown up experiencing that, if you've heard what's called the gospel before, that we believe that Jesus Christ came, he lived a sinless life, he died on the cross for our sins, and he raised from the dead so that we might have eternal life. The scripture tells us we believe that, and we'll have eternal life. And so in the book of Hebrews, we get this picture of how uh, things went from what's called the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the law. So remember, God gave that to his people to give them this perfect standard. And so we go from the law to now the spirit. Now, Jesus talked about the spirit when he was uh, in, in this world doing his ministry. And he kept telling people, like, I'm going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for the sins of the world. And uh, in fact, uh, Alana and I were, uh, she brought her kids Bible today and she was kind of thumbing through it. And she got to the part where uh, Jesus, he came back to life and He's got the marks in his hand, and Thomas is going, show me the evidence. And, and Alana said that we were actually in the middle of the songs, but then why does he have the marks there? Well, because it's the proof of what he's already done for us on the cross. He came back to life. He still bore the scars for us, the proof of what he did for us. And I believe Luke, who wrote, the, uh, wrote Hebrews, uh, is going to help us understand today, how do we move from that place of the law, like this perfect law, like here's all the things we're supposed to do, uh, here's this perfect standard to living in a way where we, we acknowledge that Jesus has died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Like, I feel like so many of us in the room, we're walking around, like, in this mode of, of shame a lot of the time. Like, we make a mistake one day or this week, and then we think, like, oh, like, I don't know if I can even go to church because I messed up again. But what has God <coughs> done for us? He said, you don't have to live in that space anymore. Here's the perfect standard of the law, but the question is, how do we get from the law to the Spirit of God that lives inside of us? Jesus said, you want me to go. You want me to go so that the helper, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to dwell inside of us. So we move from this place of, of going like, how do we even, we can't even gain access to God. He's like, he's in the holy place. The priest could only go in there once a year and people would bring all their sacrifices so that the blood could be spilled, so that their sins could be covered. And we're going to see in this passage today is that when we see this, uh, Luke is going to say in the book of Hebrews that, that all of that was to show people their need for a more perfect sacrifice for Jesus. So we no longer have to go to the temple and give the bull or the lamb or whatever to the priest and say, can you take care of this? Because this needs to cover the sins of, of us, of our family, of our house. I love we were talking about that this morning. So what are we going to do? Whoever family is going to serve? Well, hopefully the Lord. But to be holy, to walk in holiness is maybe a little easier than you might think. And so today I want to get things started off with, wow, it's like the perfect timing too of the new screen. Um, I was hoping we would have this. I got a video I want to share with you about this view of the temple. So go ahead and take a look. The biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's <coughs> heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but 
even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that the king came from God in the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest, and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule, was filling the world through his own life, death, and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple, and this new temple would expand out and include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become many temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building. But people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So, at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building, because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people. we meet in a church building. <clears throat> but yeah, when God talks about the temple and how he transitioned from the Old Testament to the New Testament, Old Covenant to the New Covenant, we see that uh, we ourselves become this indwelling of God, the spirit that lives inside of us. And so for many of us, it's moving from this place of, of not having to try to feel like we have to fulfill every aspect of the law in the Old Testament to understanding that it's okay. Right? We make mistakes. God's spirit, he lives inside of us and he convicts us over that, but he's already covered us. So how do we gain access? How do we become holy? The good news is if you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, you already are, right? And we don't have to walk in that way. And so let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. We start at the law. So we're going to get like this lesson from the beginning uh, to the end. How are we supposed to view the law? Well, uh, in regards to the sacrificial system, we know that it's insufficient to cover sins permanently. So let's read it starting in verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So from the very beginning, the, the law was this picture. It was to show us our need for God. Continually trying to be perfect doesn't work. We're always going to fall short in one area or another. And, and what the text says about the law is that it's this shadow. So in the Greek, it's this word skia, shadow. It, it's like if you have a sketch or an outline or, yeah, like you maybe hold up a flashlight and you like to do uh, animals or puppets or whatever on the wall. My kids love that now. They're like, do the flashlight, do the animal puppets. It's so much fun. But what do you see in that? You don't actually see your hand. You don't see the object itself. You see this projection, the shadow. It kind of makes you go, I think I know what that is, but I'm not completely sure. And so if you look through Hebrews, you're going to see a few things. In fact, after chapter 10, you're going to see all these people. We call it the hall of faith in the scripture. Who said, the scripture says, by faith. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, this person walk with God. It was counted to them as righteousness because they were faithful to God. So where does this leave us? When we look at the law, we go, okay, I know I'm not perfect. I know I can't fulfill that. But the good news is that, well, Jesus is taking care of it. For what? It says that the, the law is a shadow of good things to come. So what are these good things? Well, we're going to see what, see what it has to say. 
Uh, Chrysostom, who was a church father, said this about verse 1. He says, as in a painting, so long as one draws the outlines, it is a short of a shadow. But when one has added the bright paints, laid in the colors, then it becomes an image, something of this kind also with the law. So when we look at the law, it's almost like you see maybe a kid in the outlining or tracing something, <coughs> trying to paint inside the lines at some point, and it sort of comes to life, right? If you're an artist and you get that, I can't draw, so, or paint, so please don't ask me to, it won't go well. Uh, so as I tried to picture this, I just thought of that outline, like the people saw this outline, the law, and they were looking towards this future, what was going to be this beautiful colored picture that was going to come to life. And so then we get to verses 5 through 7, we see that Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial system, so Jesus was perfectly sufficient to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future. And sometimes I see, you know, the cross with, you know, Jesus hanging on it, and I, and I kind of wonder, some people will say, well, I, you know, I messed up again today, I've got to ask Jesus, like, he's got to, he's got to go back up on the cross, and he's got to, he's got to take care of my sins, but, but what do we know, what the scripture tells us? Well, Jesus did this once and for all. We didn't have to keep, like, and we'd run out of money too, right? To, to buy the lamb or the bull again and again and again. We've got to we've got to make sure we take care of our families. We've got to cover the sins with the offering. But, but Jesus said you don't have to do that anymore. And so verse five it says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll. Of the book. So this is a quote from Psalm 40. What did Christ do when he came into the world? He says, hey, sacrifice is here. As he continued to tell people, I love that we were in the quiet time today on, on Jesus' uh, triumphal in entry. Right? He's, he's getting ready. He's going in. Um, he, he knows he's going he's gonna to die for the sins of the world. He keeps telling people, and they're like, yeah, go Jesus. You know, take over the Roman government. And he's like, uh, no, that's no, not exactly what's going to happen right now. See, I'm going to be the lamb now. And then later on, I'm going to be this conquering lion that's going to come back and take over everything and establish my kingdom for a, forever. But they didn't quite get it. No, he said, I've come to be the sacrifice, the sacrifice for our sins. And this transitions us from the place of like seeing this like outline, the shadow of the law, and then going like, oh my goodness, this, this picture has been colored in for us, right? We're, we're so fortunate because we can look at both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't throw out one or the other. Remember, we've talked about this. We've, we've even sang songs about this. Um, I asked a lot of this morning too. The kids' quiet time was about um, music, so we can sing a song of praise to God. We be thankful for God. He's coming on this triumphal entry. Uh, what song do you like? And she said, "It's the one we sing in church, same God." I like that one. I said, well, "Why? Why do you like that one?" Well, because God didn't ever change, right? Old Testament, New Testament. Now Old Covenant, New Covenant. But He's filled in the outline for us. He showed us this beautiful picture of what he's done for us. And he even said, hey, look, I said this was going to happen. I came, and I'm here, and I'm ready to do this. Okay, so that's the first fill in the blank of the law. Um, here's the second one, the lamb. So we have to go, we have to find this place to transition, and it's through what Jesus has done for us. And Hebrews lays this out clearly for us. We've got the law. Here's the perfect standard. You can't meet that. And then when we get to verse 8, really 8 through 14, the lamb's replacing atonement is like, is made clear to us. So um, to, to make it clear, like, like Jesus showed up, he's both the lion and the lamb, but he's the perfect sacrifice. So when he was the lamb that got up there, he died for the sins of the world. Hebrews is going to make this clear for us. There was, only, there was only one person in all of human history that could do this, and it was the God who was also man, Jesus. So in verse 8, it says, When he said above, You have neither desire nor taken pleasure in sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus did this for us, right? He covered all of our sins, past, present, and future. He was, he was the literal replacement for the sacrificial system. So instead of you know, waking up each day and going, oh no, here are all these things I got to keep track of. I got to make sure we make atonement. I got to make sure we take care of these sins. I don't want my, my family to get in trouble because we haven't brought the you know correct sacrifice to take care of this. But Jesus has done something for us. As he, as he does away with the first in order to establish the second. 
which will be grace and salvation for us. And then in verse 10, it says, And by that will, for the will of God, we have been sanctified. That's a really good word to hear, isn't it? You know, some of us have uh, come in here and like, I, I need to hear about that, being sanctified today. Well, in the Greek, it's the word hagaiazo. It's a really cool word. It means to purify, to cleanse externally, to purify by expiation from uh, the guilt of sin. To purify internally by the renewing of our soul. And, and God is doing this just continually in us, right? I know we, um, we all struggle. We make mistakes. But when we come back to this, and Jesus is going, you don't have to keep coming back. Like this sacrificial system, it, it, it doesn't work to cover all sins for all time. And Jesus was the only one who could come and live that perfect life for us and die on the cross and spill his blood. Like we talked about last week, it, it's like, well, why did they put the lamb's blood on the doorpost, on the lintel, on the sides? When God came through to judge the land of Egypt and the people who were oppressing his own people, he wanted them to understand, I've got the keys to life and death and everything else. I'm in control. And more than that, when he colors in the picture, when he colors in the outline for us, when Jesus shows up, he goes, I've sanctified my people. I've sanctified them through what? The offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So did he need to keep getting back up there? And, you know, do we need to keep going like each day? Like, like Jesus, I think you're going to have to get back up on the cross because what you did isn't sufficient. And you might say, well, I don't really think that. I mean, I don't walk around going like, Jesus, you're going to have to die for my sins again. But we kind of do it with the way we live sometimes, right? You know, we, we go about our days and we may make, make a mistake. We may not treat somebody well. We make a lot, like, That's not how a Christian should live. Like, Jesus, I've just messed up. And oh my gosh, I'm just living in the shame and what happens? Like we, we listen to the whispers of the enemy. We listen to the, the whispers of the devil who says, did Jesus really say that your sins were covered past, present, and future? Did he, did he really say that? Maybe you should be walking in shame today because you, you're just not good enough for God. But here's the good news. We don't have to be good enough for God. And we rest in his grace. Well, he's already done. That. We can get up in the morning and say, hey, Satan, whatever lies, whatever things you're going to throw at us today, they don't. Because I walk in confidence and I walk in peace because I know what God has done for me. We've been sanctified. We just need to be reminded of that, right? Sometimes we just need to wake up and, be, and, and go, okay, God, thank you for sanctifying me. You've purified me. And in verse 11, 11 through 14, the Lamb has this unmistakable power. God has this unmistakable power. We can't, we can't pretend he's like somebody else. We, he's not like the old sacrificial system. Um, he's like, not like the, the imperfect Lamb, but he's a perfect perfect, powerful God who can do this. And so in verse 11, it says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. <clears throat> Is there any question there of God's power, of what he accomplished for us? I love this at the end here too because it's this continual motion. He says in verse 14, <clears throat> for by a single offering, it means one time, once for all, he perfected for all time. Is that like just for a little time? Like Jesus got on the cross, he's like, this is going to last about a month, okay? So you got to get in, make sure you get your pass, get your ticket, and then it's not going to be offered anymore. You know, he says, Verse 14, a single offering has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And it's hope for us too. You know, we've, we've been sanctified, but he still says here, it's covered for all time, past, present, and future. And at the end of this, he says, those who are being sanctified. Have you ever wondered, you're like, you know what? I just, I, I'm not as godly as I'd like to be. <laughs> you know, we, we should always be thinking that. Like every day we wake up and go, you know what, God, I just, I need to grow more. I need to be closer to you. Here's this area of my life. Like, I just, I just want you to take over. I, I know I, I think about that a lot, but the good news is even the scripture tells us that. We've been sanctified, so we've been covered. It's like if you were to die today and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you believe what he's done for you, you'll be with him in heaven forever. For, the, for those of us who are still here, we're going about life, and we struggle, we make mistakes. He says, hey, here, here's some good news. He's not only died for the sins of all time, for the whole world, but he's continually walking alongside us, purifying us, sanctifying us. No matter what's going on, no matter where we're at, no matter how we're struggling, he says, I'm right here, purifying you from the inside 
Um, there's a lot of other influences in the world and things that are going on, but the good news is that he's like, I'm right here. I'm continually sanctifying you. I've sealed you to me. So we've got the law. Uh, we've got the lamb. So we've got to transition. We've got to understand, hey, there's this imperfect outline of God's perfect standard, right? We'll never be able to attain that. We'll never be able to reach it. And the goodness is that there was this one perfect person, God himself, who came down, died for us, spilled his blood for us on the cross. That's the lamb. The good news is he's also the lion. And what he said would come would be this establishment of his temple, of his kingdom in the world that would move forward. It's like what we saw in the video. It went from this one singular place. People have to come and bring their offerings, and they have to hope that would cover them. And then after Jesus came, he said, the helper is going to come. You look in the book of Acts, the Spirit fell at Pentecost, and from that point on, all believers had access to God directly. Isn't that good news? When Jesus, he, he breathed he breathed his last breath, it tells us that the script, the, the veil was torn in, in half. So it's more than just a doorway. It's this, it's this veil that separated us from God's presence. And when it was torn in half and the whole earth was shaking and things were going on, people were like, what is happening, right? God said, it's been done. There's not even a door there anymore. The veil's been torn in half, and now you can go directly to God. And he confirmed this with the Spirit. And so starting in verse 15, to close this out about the Spirit, we need to understand there's no shame, there's no condemnation, and there's no further offering for you. I think some of us need to hear that today. And I don't know where you're you're coming in from. I mean, there's been some hard weeks. I know I've talked to a lot of you in the last couple of weeks. You're like, man, it just, like, I thought it was going to slow down after Christmas, and I just feel like bogged down. I just feel beat up. So what do we need to hear today about the Spirit, about this, this transition from the law to the Spirit, what God has done for us? There's not any more shame. Like, we don't need to walk into this place with shame. We shouldn't walk out of this place with shame, right? As we walk about in the world, we trust in what God's done for us. And there's no condemnation either. So we've read this in Scripture in Romans. You see this. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So wherever you go, whatever you're doing, Satan, he likes to lie to us, right? He likes to tell us, oh, you're not good enough. He'll never measure up. And you're like, hey, you know what, Satan? You're right, I'm not. The good news is I don't get condemned for that. Jesus died for me, so I don't have to walk in condemnation. And even more than that, what do we, what do we also need to remember? There's no further sacrifice needed. I feel like some of us in the room, maybe some of you online, you're just like, you keep living your life in this way of like, I just have to do enough good things to get God's favor. Like to, to if I if I do this, then he'll be like, you know, good job. And you know, you're gonna get to heaven when you die. And and we feel like, you know, when I, when I stand before God, there's gonna be the scale. And if I've done enough good things and that gets on the scale and, and all my bad stuff's like not quite as much, then God will be like, Good job. You know, you've done it. But does God care about those things? Well, he wants to live a godly life, but more than that, he wants to know that you don't have to live your life in this way of just like I'm um, walking on eggshells. i got to make sure I do this. And if I don't do that, God's going to hes gonna be upset with me. No, there, there's no further offering needed. So Jesus died for us. He rose from the dead. This will change the way that we live. But we can't live in this way of constant anxiety of trying to make sure that we live with this perfect life. The outline of the law tells us that's not possible. And when Jesus paints it in, he goes, good news, you don't have to walk in condemnation. And you don't have to live like there's a further offering that's needed, right? It should be so freeing to us, right? We walk out of this place that we don't have to go, I have to be good enough to merit God's favor. Nobody in the room has to do that. The Bible doesn't say that. We live lives to honor God, but we don't walk acting like there's a further offering that's needed. So in verse 15, points us this idea that the Spirit continually affirms this truth. Like as we struggle throughout the day, the week, whatever's going on, the Spirit who lives inside of us, God's presence is going to go, hey, Remember, you don't have to walk in condemnation. So here's what it says in verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying. So Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit as this helper. This is, in fact, you look throughout the scriptures, you hear helper attributed to women or a wife in the text. So um, value on women too should be really, really high for us. And then again, God uses kind of some of that same language. He says the Spirit is going to be this great helper to you. In times of difficulty, in times of struggle, in times where you're just like, I just feel like trash. God comes alongside of us through the Spirit and goes, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to walk in condemnation or shame because there's no further offering that's needed, right? And then verse 16, the Spirit works on our hearts and minds to 
but it's only for those who know God, right? Now, we live in a world where people say, well, you have a conscience, you know. Uh, most people should know, like, what's the wrong thing to do and what's the right thing. I feel like that's been maybe more skewed lately in our modern-day culture. Um, I was looking at an um, article recently. It was an update from an article I read a few years ago of a young man who, who ran into a lady who was pushing a stroller and her kid. And um, you know, they were okay, but it still was like a really grievous act. And, and some people were like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I think he eventually got a slap on the wrist. And, um, <laughs> but some people go, no, that, that's wrong. Like you should never attack the weak and the innocent. Like that's just wrong. And so for a lot of people in society, even if they don't know God, they don't have a relationship with him, something in them should be triggered to go, that's not right. There are things that we see in the world that are not right. When people are oppressed, when they're abused, when they're taken advantage of, but the good news is for us that we have this, uh, this, it's like another level of a conscience, but it's so much greater than that. The Holy Spirit that teaches us about the things of God and reminds us who we are. Like if we're just relying on a conscience, like what's good and what's right, and what's wrong, evil and what's wrong and what's good, then, then that's not really going to get us through, right? A lot of that has to do with our own personal perception too, but the Spirit lives inside of us, gives us a better view. <clears throat> so it says in verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. This is good news. Now, Jesus, this actual text in Hebrews, I believe Luke's writing this, and he's, he's, he's actually referencing a text in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 33, and it says this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my if you think of the perspective that Jeremiah was writing this from, and that Luke references here in Hebrews about what Jesus has already done and about the Spirit, which confirms everything that we believe inside of us, he said something miraculous is going to take place. And the people of God at that time, you remember Jeremiah, he was a weeping prophet, he was a wailing prophet, he was a lot of things, but, but not a guy who um, really got to tell a lot of really positive messages. Because he was constantly telling the people of God, stop worshiping idols. Stop following everything else except for God. Re remember the temple. Remember who God is. Remember what the law is. Like, it, have we forgotten all these things? And he's just constantly reminding them. And, and even before the, the, the people of Babylon, they're going to come in, they're going to they destroy the temple and Jerusalem, just leveled everything. And it took everybody into captivity. Before that happens, Jeremiah is given this word from the Lord. And he says, for this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, after everything was really, really bad, what does he say? He says, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. At that time, they didn't have the law in their minds, in their hearts. What else does he say? I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That should be miraculous news to us, shouldn't it? That, that God, before any of these events took place, he knew the people were going to suffer because of the bad choices that they made. He gives a word of hope to Jeremiah. If he has any words of hope, he goes, there's a day coming. When Jesus is going to show up. And the good news is, for everybody who believes in him, they're not just going to have eternal life. They're going to have this helper who's going to come. And he's going to live and he's going to dwell inside of them. And I'm going to put my words on their hearts. I'm going to put that law on their hearts and their minds. And it's not just going to be about doing what society deems is like right or wrong. Or doing what your conscience says. We've heard that phrase before, follow your heart. Well, a heart that belongs to God is one that's going to make the good and the right choices. And it's going to stay close to God. But Jeremiah, he didn't get to see this until he was already up there in heaven. But something miraculous has been done for us. And we should not lose sight of this from the law to the spirit. This is a great gift. The people didn't have all the time. Only after Jesus came, the lines were painted in for the law. Through what he did, the lamb on the cross for us. And he's given us the spirit which makes us these Temples. It's, e it's even better than going and knocking on the, t the inner temple door and having this free pass to go in whatever you want. We don't have to go to a place. We don't have to go to Jerusalem and go in the temple and be like, okay, I've got my ticket. You know, I'm here for my once in a lifetime visit if you ever get to go. Um, you should. And so you get to the temple and you go, okay, I got my ticket. I can go in. Good news. Free access. Jesus died for you. Oh, you're a believer. You can go in the temple and you can spend time with God. Better than that. <coughs> He's with us everywhere. Scripture confirms this for us that. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. We put our faith and trust in Him. That's the case. We don't have to go to some far-off temple. We don't have to go and take the animal sacrifice. We go, I believe what Jesus has done for me. And He gives us the Spirit. 
like that. Better than anything else. In verse 17, the Spirit reminds us that we are free from the bondage of our former self. Sometimes I, I feel like we do. We fall back in that place of like walking into who we were, or, or, or like we put back on the handcuffs of, of who we were formerly before we knew Christ, or even before we maybe made more positive decisions to follow him more faithfully. And, and we, we think like, this, this is better. It's, it's not. Because what has God given us this opportunity? I want to walk in freedom. So he says in verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Who, who needed to hear that this morning? Walk in and you're, you're bound by a lot of things that we don't need to be bound by, right? And we all struggle with different things. When we hear that, we hear that verse, I mean, this, this should be framed to us. The Spirit of God lives inside us. He's reminding us. And then he's going to add this, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Whatever you've done, wherever you've come from, to do this is, you're going to have to go to a place, make offering, you're going to have to travel somewhere, a spirit, we believe, lives inside of us. And holiness, it's a little bit easier when we make it, right? We walk with God daily. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have the spirit of God. I'd make a lot of bad choices. Uh, we do, left to ourselves. So we'll close in verse 18. The spirit teaches us that we're free to worship and know God more deeply. Like if, we, if we're not bound, <laughs> if we're not living in this place of bondage, like we're not constantly like wherever we go, and I'm just man, I'm so sad, I'm so depressed because I just I can't seem to get things together. I just like man, even just like the kids in the morning getting them out the door, and then I'm yelling at everybody. I'm like, why, you know? And then we feel bad about ourselves, right? And we're like, why can't I get this thing down? God, I'm just not worthy. And He's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> the good news is because I've already taken care of it for you, right? We've got the Spirit. It reminds us. Verse 18 says, where there is forgiveness of these. There's no longer any offering for sin. Where is this forgiveness? Well, it's right here. And you have access to it. This word here, forgiveness, in the Greek, it's the Ephesus, means to release from the bondage of sin or its imprisonment. And you don't have to, you don't have to wonder, right? Maybe you're listening online, you're here in person. You, you don't have to leave this place. You don't have to stop listening and go, I don't know if I can live in confidence and peace in knowing God. Because what has he given us this freedom to do? Not just go, hey, you don't have to live under shame. You don't have to live under condemnation. There's no more sacrifice needed when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. When you believe, you're good to go. Will life be easy all the time? No. There's going to be struggle. There's going to be difficulty. But the good news is, he says, hey, remember, where there's forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. He just doesn't have to get back up on the cross. He's pardoned us fully. And uh, man, I hope, I hope that you would leave the video or walk out of this place uh, this morning and, and know that you don't have to do that. You, you don't have to keep putting Jesus up there. You don't have to, to live under this weight and bondage and the bad choices that you made. Even the ones you made this morning when you got up, right? I know we're going to be late to church. All right, no, 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 stop yelling. Get in the car. We got to go. <laughs> we don't have to live under any of those things because the forgiveness is... There's no longer any offering needed. Jesus took care of it, right? It should be framed to us. I hope that it is. Um, as I was finishing up this message, I saw something yesterday, and uh, it was uh, an article on a pardon that had been issued by a former president. So 46 years ago, you may have seen this. 1977, President Jimmy Carter, he pardoned all those who dodged or got out of the draft for the Vietnam War. There's a lot of mixed opinions about these things in the past, but when I read that, I was going like, how, 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 how did those guys, how did they feel? How much did they have felt? Maybe leaving, even leaving the country or, or running away or doing something to get out of that, to not give their service to their country. Some would say that was dishonorable. Jimmy Carter, when he was asked about this decision, um, he said, so how did you feel about that? He, was, he said, it was the single most difficult decision of my presidency. To pardon those who dodged the draft. And you know what God's done for us? He's done something so much better in pardoning, pardoning us from getting out of a worldly conflict. He pardoned us from our sin. But you know where it destined us to? Hell, separated from God forever. That's the good news. There's no longer any offering needed. He's already taken care of it. If you made that decision today to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never have to worry about it again. If you haven't, I hope 
that you will. I'll share one more story in closing. Because I don't know where we're at today. And I felt like this young man's story was one maybe you needed to hear. Um, I did student ministry for, for 10 years in Texas. And there was this young, one young man I'll never forget. Um, I was at a school lunch. I was actually at school in the cafeteria when they used to do that. Hopefully they'll do that again uh, one day. Uh, they let the minister come in and have lunch with the kids. So I was having lunch with all our kids from our church. And this one young man came up to me. He was a senior in high school, very proud. He was about to head off to bigger and greater things, uh, as they always have that perspective. And he sat down and started questioning me about God. I don't believe any of this. I can't, I can't believe you would tell people this. And, you know, uh, it just, you know, it just is what it is. And he said, he, I remember the last thing he said to me before he left that lunch, he said, I don't need God. And I thought, as the Spirit was speaking, I thought, that's going to change one day. It's going to come back to me. And it was about a month later, we were in a youth gathering. It was, a, it was on a Wednesday night, so he was there. He, was, he actually showed up. He was invited by somebody else, and he's acting like, I don't want to be here. I don't need this. Don't and he's like sitting in the back making jokes. And then at the end, a lot of people had already left. He comes up to me sobbing, and he, he puts his arms around me, and he said, I was wrong. I was wrong, and I need God. And so right there, with a senior in high school, proud boy, much bigger than me, <laughs> A little bit scary to play football all that. And he put his arms around me and said, I, I was wrong. I need God. And I hope, I hope, his life was changed that day forevermore. I would hope that none of us would walk out of the room or anybody listening would not hear that story, would not read Hebrews and go, isn't it amazing where God has taken us from this law, this, this imperfect outline? We couldn't even really see clearly how we needed to be close to God, how we could. And then the Lamb steps in, Jesus, and he paints it all in for us. And we're like, wow. It's amazing. You know, we receive that, we accept God into our lives, gives us the Spirit, and it reminds us, hey, there's hope. You don't have to walk in shame. You don't have to walk in condemnation. And there's no offering that's needed. Jesus took care of it once and for all. Let me pray for us, and we'll close. Father, we come to you today, God, some of us with uh, burdened hearts and minds for where we come from in life, uh, for our backgrounds. Uh, maybe those who we didn't grow up in the church and God, we're just trying to learn this thing for the first time where it's new and we, we struggle to, to not have to live in this way of bondage to our former sins. And God, we're thankful that you gave us the law to show us our need for you, that you stepped out of time, stepped out of eternity to live a perfect life for us, to die on the cross as that perfect sacrificial lamb. We're thankful that you're the lion and you conquered death and sin where that forgiveness is, we're glad that the scripture tells us we have been forgiven. Thankful that you give us a spirit that reminds us of that daily. I pray that everybody in the room, uh, everybody listening to these words, whether it be online right now or later, uh, watching, um, I just pray that you would give them confidence and hope uh, to know that um, there is a hope. We wake up each day and we don't have to live in this bondage. And we don't have to walk in condemnation. For you have offered this forgiveness. It's free. We have access to it. And it can change our lives. We thank you, God, for that. And it's in your name we pray.